Police. Fire. Ambulance. Coast Guard. The emergency services. Day in, day out, 24 hours a day. 999. They're there. The northeast of England, a hundred miles of coastline and home to more than a million people. The emergency services here are amongst the busiest in the country and for this week's Songs of Praise, they've all come together at St George's Church, Jesmond. Newcastle at night, pubs, parties and people. Part of this nightlife, the Northumbria Police Force. This time of night, uh, it's quite a, quite a happy sort of atmosphere and things are OK. Uh, later on, that can change. But remember that the majority of people are down here simply for the purpose of enjoying themselves. They're not down here to cause trouble. But things do happen, and uh, people do get in, into scrapes later on. We had an experience last week in the van where I saw somebody uh, who wanted to hit the front of the van with his fist and I looked at him and I thought I can't believe that he, he, he just it, I know in the past I would have been the first one out of the van to arrest him but I looked at him and I just saw a young man who'd had too much to drink but he wasn't really being nasty or vindictive he was just had too much to drink didn't know what he was doing I became a Christian uh, that I believe now that I have a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as a saviour. And as such, that's changed my view of some of the people here. Before, I saw them as 
as just objects that were probably going to cause trouble. Now I see them very differently. I see them, I hope, hopefully, through the love of Jesus' eyes. Would you say that um, you're becoming a bit of a softie now? <laughs> Anything but. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I signed up to do was to uphold the law. And if that means uh, getting out and getting stuck into situations, then I'm afraid that's actually what I've got to do. the night time but the party really begins on Tyneside with a win here. Basically we're made here to make sure that the crowd get into the ground safely there's no trouble outside the ground particularly our responsibility is outside the ground here making sure people aren't entering the ground drunk and uh, everything goes off peacefully. As a Christian I sometimes feel uh, absolutely passionate and uh, you know, wanting to dance and shout just like a football supporter about my God. And yet, when things aren't going so well for me, uh, when things are, are in their sort of lowest moments, I know that God's still there. He's still got his, his hand in your hand and he's helping you through. One of the things that is quite important and serious in, uh, in this area is hopelessness. And uh, there's a lot of people who have no hope of getting a job, they have no hope of getting a house. And those people are, it's essential that we preach a social gospel. It's essential that we, as Christians, are starting to look out of our, outside of ourselves as a church and look at people for what they are.
little bit. <laughs> Why don't you get dressed inside before you come out? It's much quicker doing it this way, because we spend too much time getting dressed otherwise. Yeah. So you always leave all your gear in here? All the gear's left inside, yeah. we get it all on, and then, we, uh, then we're ready for a fire whenever we get there. Right. So right at this particular moment, I mean, what's going through your mind? Just what we're heading towards us. The officer in charge tells us where we're going, what we're doing, and he tells us whether we need to put breathing apparatus on or if it's just an ordinary car fire or something like that. Sometimes you're wondering what's actually going, you're going to end up at, what sort of incident you're going to end up at. Uh, you've got some idea because you get the radio messages coming which gives you certain information, but at times the information you get bears no resemblance to what it is when you get there. There's always a thought in the back of our minds that we could be injured, that we could be hurt, and that what we're doing is dangerous, because that is the nature of the job. It's become more technical from our side, from the firefighters' side. We have more, more equipment, newer equipment. We have all sorts of uh, new innovations that have come up. But generally speaking, what happens outside hasn't changed a lot at all. But it's still fire, it's still a car accident, it's still somebody trapped somewhere, and that's never changed. Ray Richardson has just completed another 16-hour shift at Fullwell Fire Station in Sunderland, just one of two jobs he's qualified for. I'm a fully ordained minister and do everything that a minister, a full-time minister would normally do. Uh, marry people, baptise people, bury people and do ordinary church services and also uh, ordinary counselling as well. So how do you now balance being a minister with being a firefighter? Well, the two jobs complement themselves. They, uh, they do a very similar thing, serving the public, doing things for other people that they can't do for themselves necessarily and being available for them. When you put that uniform on, what does that make you feel like? Well, as a Christian, uh, the uh, Bible tells us about the armour of God and uh, quite often I think about the, the firefighter's kit as the same sort of thing, the armour of God, the helmet uh, of salvation, the, the cloak and the boots and the gloves and the girdle and all sorts of things. And uh, generally that's how I look at it because it is a protection. I think the, um, the fact that Jesus came to the world, that he got his hands dirty, that he was uh, there amongst the, the people who were unlovely, and in some cases when we go to fires, that's just how it is. It's not a very nice picture, but we're prepared to go in and get dirty and do the job that we have to do. And Jesus suffered, and we're prepared in some respects to suffer as well.
Red car lifeboat, red car lifeboat. This is Titan's Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is in being to coordinate uh, search and rescue. And uh, this centre is responsible for an area of the North Sea covering some 15,000 square miles, from Berwick upon Tweed, the Scottish English border, to approximately the North Yorkshire county boundary line. Well, in this centre here, we constantly monitor uh, both the radio lines and the telephone lines. So anyone who's in any trouble, whether on the shoreline or at sea, the information will be transferred to this particular station and the chaps on watch here, ladies and chaps on watch here, will respond accordingly. For a repetition of the marine calling, so for... Depending on the situation, either by sending lifeboats or helicopters or indeed our own rescue teams made up of volunteers who live along the coastline, they give of the time to support the regular Coast Guard service and actually do the physical trudging and lifting and rescues for us. What would you say is the hardest thing about your job? It's got to be terminating a search. When you've spent several hours looking for someone and the result has been nothing. We haven't found the person or persons we've been looking for. For me personally, I think and toy over with the ideas that have I done enough? Have I gone over all the possibilities? Is there a remote, just the simplest, smallest remote detail that I perhaps overlook. How do you make that decision? You've got to get on with it. You've got to convince yourself that you've done all that you possibly could have done under the circumstances. And um, just get on with life and proceed with it. I pray. Um, I'm not frightened to say that I pray. I attend church regularly. And I think that's what gives me enough uh, support in order to do what I do and get along with it. If you've been in a really bad accident and you need hospital care, this is where it all begins, in the back of an ambulance. But, Paul, I actually thought it happened in the hospital. Well, actually, that was true in years gone by, but now with the advent of paramedic training and the increasing technology that we now have on the ambulances, 
In effect, what we're actually doing is bringing the hospital to the patient. We do a host of different procedures in the vehicle. The equipment that we have is all tuned to a specific task. We have quite a useful little device called the pulse oximeter. What this actually does, once it's clipped on your finger, if I can just... Don't worry, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> there we go. Ow. No, just teasing. <laughs> Right, what this actually does, it monitors the amount of oxygen your body is breathing in at any one time, and it also takes your pulse as well. So from this, I can ascertain whether you need oxygen therapy or not. Do I? Absolutely not. That's, that's actually very good. 99% is the highest you can get. And your pulse is fine as well, so you're looking good for now. Quite often, members of the public can be quite frustrated because quite often they'll see an ambulance turning up to the scene and to the public it seems like an eternity before the ambulance moves on. But what they don't realise is what's actually happening is the ambulance crew are employing vital techniques which is going to be important to the patient's future health and possible survival. Not all of our work is actually dealing with car accidents and people who are dying. Quite often you'll have someone, an old person or a lonely person, will ring up 999 simply because they're lonely. What do you do then? Actually, I try and just talk to the patient and say, well, look, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And, I mean, not, not preach to anybody, but just say, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, there's always hope. Are you frightened about saying, well, there's God there? <laughs> well, it would be unethical, really, and unprofessional to say to someone, well, you know, there's God there. Um, but what I try and inst instil in, in patients who are at the sort of the depths of despair is hope. And quite often, you'll get feedback from that. I remember one patient I got who had a, a stroke, and she was a Christian lady, and she was in the absolute depths of despair, this lady. And I knew she was a Christian, so I said, well, look, you know, I'm a Christian too, and, you know, things are going to be OK. And I actually got a thank you letter from her, saying, you know, the guy really helped us. So sometimes you can say something insignificant to somebody, but it could mean the world to them.
Linda will never forget the day, two years ago, when there was a knock at the door and two policemen were standing there holding her teenage son's rucksack. They got me up there fairly quickly um, after allowing me to ring his father to let him know. Uh, he had to make his way there from Whitley Bay. I just wanted to get there as quickly as possible, but there was a feeling of sort of frozen calm. I was just desperate to see him. One thing I do remember when we uh, were pulled up on seeing yeah. the fact that uh, we noticed that he had a, a cycle helmet on, and mm. uh, I'm sure things would have been a lot worse if it hadn't been for the fact that you were wearing yes. some sort of protection. Uh -huh. My helmet cracked instead of my head. Yes, exactly, yeah. that's, that's right. That's right, yeah. I know prayers were said in Methodist churches, synagogue, as I work with a Jewish lady, um, and messages from all over the world. And that sort of supportive network has sort of strengthened my, my faith um, and strengthened my belief in the power of prayer. I'm just so, so pleased that I've still got Scott and that he has got a good quality of life and that there is hope for the future. I don't think I ever gave up hope that he wouldn't pull through, but what I was most worried about was that his quality of life would be so impaired that um, he, he wouldn't have a future at all. But he's, he's at college now, uh, he's re-establishing his social life, and he's beginning to enjoy life. He's had a second chance at it. I owe them my life, really, as they saved it. But I can't give them my life. I can't think of anything I could give to them to show my gratitude. Thank you. That's all I could, one word that I could say to them. Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for those who work in the emergency services. Protect us, we pray, especially when we are called to duty, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you're with us, no matter what the circumstances are around us. Please, God, help us make the right decisions to save those in distress. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
another 24 hours of protection. Without doubt, we put our trust in the emergency services, and it's reassuring to discover that behind the uniform, you can find compassion, humanity, and faith. Next week, the spirit of St George is alive and well as we celebrate the return of Rutland, England's smallest county. Abolished 20 years ago, now it's back again. Later this evening here on BBC One, there's a behind-the-scenes look at the papal election process, its secrets and its candidates, and every man at 10.50. Next Sunday, take lessons in...